Hi, I'm Lucy Brogdon, Chair of the National Mental Health Commission Advisory Board. Welcome to this online conference. What an innovative approach to sharing knowledge and learnings right across the country. I understand there are thousands of you online ready to learn and work. The Mental Health Professional Network is truly taking a novel way to share wisdom with all of you and it's to be applauded. Working better together is the theme of this conference and it's a great opportunity to learn more about mental health in the military, about grief and loss, and about trauma and adverse childhood experiences, all important topics that need our best attention and our best minds tackling these issues. We know the issues faced by our military and the risk to develop mental illness. We also know there are protective factors. This conference will bring together that conversation and work out how we best protect our serving people. Grief and loss affect all of us at different stages in our life. Understanding what drives that in people and how to best support them in their journey is really important. One of the frustrations for me at the National Mental Health Commission is seeing how stubbornly our incidence of mental health sits when we look at other non-communicable diseases. And what we know is that it is trauma and adverse childhood experiences that often lead people to a journey in the mental health system. If we can better address those experiences in childhood, prevent them, mitigate their impact, and try and understand trauma, we set so many people on a more positive journey through life. Thank you all for coming online to join the conference and to be part of these important conversations. I wish you every success. Thank you. Hello and welcome everybody to this webinar on the military experience and mental health, understanding the nexus. And this uh, webinar is being delivered as part of MHPN's inaugural online conference, Working Better Together. A very warm welcome to all of you who've joined us tonight for the live activity. And I should say that, that um, we've had an extraordinary number of registrations for this theme in the conference. We've had over 3,500 registrations for the uh, military and mental health theme, which is an extraordinary number and I think a testament to just how important this area is for us as clinicians. A very warm welcome to those of you who are watching us later on a recording. And of course, a very warm welcome to our panelists who I will introduce in just a moment. First, I'd like to pay our respect uh, and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our panelists and our participants are located. Uh, and I'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and future. My name is Mark, Mark Creamer. I'm a clinical psychologist in private practice and a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Melbourne. And I've had a very long interest in the mental health effects of trauma, and particularly in veteran and military mental health. And I've always been intrigued by the relationship between military experience and subsequent psychological health and well-being, both good and bad. And so it's a great honor tonight to be able to facilitate this discussion and to pick the brains of our expert panel. So without further ado, let me introduce them. You've all had their biographies, and so I'll keep it very brief. First, I'd like to introduce Brad Murphy. Brad is a very experienced general practitioner coming to us tonight from Bundaberg in Queensland. He's had a fascinating career, joined the uh, Royal Australian Navy at the age of 15. Uh, uh, six years later, he retrained as an intensive care paramedic, and then sometime later pursued a career in medicine at the age of 35. He has a very strong interest in indigenous health, in veteran and military health, and in rural and remote health. So he's ideally placed to uh, join us tonight and give us the benefit of his experience. Welcome, Brad. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks so much. Um, there are a million things that I could pick out of your biography that are fascinating, but I'm going to ask you about something that's not in your biography, but just intrigued me no end. When I was young, we used to have a traveling fair coming around when I was growing up in England, and I was always fascinated by the boxing tent. I was never allowed to go in, of course, but I thought it was amazing. And I understand that you're actually involved in a boxing tent sideshow. Is that right? Indeed, I am, Mark. In fact, um, the last one that remains in the world, so Fred Brophy would say, um, he's waiting at home with a cold beer for us at the end of the night. It's, uh, it's a pretty amazing uh, activity to be involved in. I was going to say, I'm amazed that it is still going on anywhere, but now, now you say that it's the last one in the world, I can well believe that, yeah. A great, a great thing. I'd love to, to, to talk offline about that at some point. Thank you, Brad. 
Um, our next panelist is Loretta Poerio. Loretta is a clinical psychologist and is the DVA mental health advisor. As well as her clinical practice, Loretta has worked in a whole range of organizations, including the Department of Defense, Centrelink, and Department of Human Services. She was Assistant National Director of VVCS, now known, of course, as Open Arms, for many years. And uh, within her family, she has uh, close connections with both the defense and military community. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, Loretta. I'm afraid that we can't see you at the moment. Uh, but oh. anyway, welcome, <laughs> welcome anyway, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Um, I hear through the grapevine that you've got some interesting travel coming up. I do. In uh, I think it's about two and a half weeks now, I'm going to Rwanda. Um, I was there in 2017. I presented at a global mental health conference, and uh, one of the organisations I met um, asked, has asked me to come back and do some training for their psychologists and counsellors. So um, that's what I'll be doing um, there for a, a, a ten days. It, it sounds an extraordinary experience. I mean, well, to state the blindingly obvious, there's a country that has had more than its fair share of trauma, isn't it? Um, but I, di I did understand also that you're going to have a bit of R&R &R at the end, is that right? Yes, so safari is, uh, well it's actually in the middle because um, of the, all sorts of reasons. Um, we're going to Kenya and Tanzania, so my husband will join me for that part of it. And that enables um, uh, uh, my, um, uh, the counsellors and psychologists to have an opportunity to uh, work on some of the things that we've uh, we've talked about, and then uh, the second part will be actually putting uh, case consultations, case presentations, and um, putting some of the, the strategies and techniques into practice. Sounds great. Sounds great. Well, good luck with that. Thank you very much, Loretta. Thank and uh, let me now introduce our final panel member, uh, Duncan Wallace. Duncan is a very experienced psychiatrist having worked across a whole range of civilian and military uh, sectors. Um, as a Navy uh, Reserve Medical Officer, he deployed to East Timor, to Iraq, to Afghanistan, and to the Persian Gulf, as well as a number of humanitarian missions. Uh, Duncan is currently uh, the psychiatrist with the ADF Center for Mental Health at HMAS Penguin in Sydney. Uh, welcome, Duncan. Thanks very much for joining us. Hello, Mark, and hello, viewers. I was chatting to Loretta there just at the end about um, having a bit of R&R &R and, and, and uh, I often ask people what they do to relax. You've got a fascinating hobby, I understand, Duncan, something to do with horses? That's right, yes. I took a polo a few years ago and I'm loving it and I got some chuckers booked on uh, Sunday, so uh, really looking forward to that. <laughs> I don't know that I should show my ignorance and ask what a chucker is, but it's oh, a game, like isn't it? It's, yeah, oh, an innings, innings okay. in a game. And I yeah. just also mentioned that uh, my experience with the boxing tent, uh, I was up in Birdsville for the races and went to the boxing tent and ended up giving first aid to a young ringer who dislocated his shoulder when he lost a bout with one of the professionals. So uh, I know the boxing tent very well and uh, I'd be way too puny to participate. Uh, absolutely. I think, yeah. Yes, absolutely. That, but still, that's very interesting and it's not surprising that there aren't too many of them left, I reckon. Thank you very much, Duncan. Thanks to all our panel members. Uh, let me just give you a, uh, the participants a, uh, a very quick orientation to the tech stuff. So uh, to access the chat box, you've got a, an open chat uh, tab on the bottom of the screen. You can put in uh, comments and questions through that. Um, there's a supporting resources tab. I would encourage you not to be looking at that at the moment. Uh, MHPN will send you a link to that after the webinar and you can go through all the great resources in your own time. There's a tech support tab as well if you get stuck. And please do at the end when you do your exit survey, please give us your feedback on how you found this platform because uh, it's very useful for us. So let me just introduce this webinar series then. Um, DBA have, a, uh, have commissioned MHPN to deliver a series of 14 webinars in the broad area of veteran and military mental health. Uh, this is the 11th in the series, so there will be three more before the end of this year. And previous ones have included topics like um, PTSD and anger and sleep and substance use and so on. And if you haven't seen those and you'd like to, they're all available on the DVA at ease website and also on the MHPM website, so, so give them a look. 
Tonight's webinar is going to explore the nexus between the experience of military service and mental health issues, and we'll be using a case vignette, a chap called Tom, who you've all had a chance to read, to, um, to, to act as a jumping off point for our discussion. Um, I should say that in two weeks' time, at the same time in the evening, on June the 4th, we will be revisiting Tom two years down the track. So we'll, be, we'll have a different panel of experts, and we will look at uh, how he is two years down the track and all the various different issues that are raised by his presentation at that point as opposed to now. So that will be a good thing to stick in your diaries uh, for two weeks today. And just while I'm in advertising mode, let me say something about next week. Next week, we're doing a session on um, uh, the implications of veteran and military mental health research for clinicians. And as a kind of starting point for that, we're, we're, um, we've got a, a, an interview with Professor Richard Bryan who discusses the various kind of recent innovations. And uh, I forgot to check before we went live tonight, but my understanding is that that uh, video and indeed an audio version will be available within the next day or so from the conference website. So if you're interested in that, have a look over the next week and join us next Tuesday for the panel discussion of experts looking at the implications of that for uh, clinicians. Anyway, let's get back to tonight. You've all had a chance to read Tom's story, and I'm sure that it rings a few bells for many of you. Tonight, we're going to use his story as a jumping off point as, as a way of kind of exploring some of the issues associated with someone at Tom's stage in his uh, military veteran career, as it were. Uh, each of our panelists is going to give a brief five-minute presentation about uh, the issues raised by Tom's case from their particular perspective, and then we'll broaden it out into uh, questions and discussions with everybody. And hopefully, uh, by the end of the webinar, um, you'll all have a better understanding of military experiences and particularly how they might affect uh, the serving member or the veteran at home or on deployment or during transition or indeed in their life as a veteran. We hope that you'll have a better awareness of the, the kind of indicators and red flags that veterans serving members might present with. And as a result of both of those two, of course, we hope that you will have um, a greater level of confidence in terms of helping serving members and veterans. OK, so without further ado, um, let me hand over to our first panelist, Brad, to talk a little bit about his reactions to Tom's story from a GP perspective. Over to you, Brad. Thanks, Mark. Um, just by, by way of sort of introducing this, the thing that really jumps out at me in what I do on a daily basis, um, in general practice, I have a practice that's pretty well focused on, uh, on veteran health. I've got, at the moment, uh, well into 300 veterans that I look after, which is about the ship's company of a guided missile frigate. Uh, the difference is when I was in the Navy, that was uh, they were all healthy. And um, now I have uh, you know, patients of all sorts of varying um, you know, degrees of, um, of mental and physical um, health concerns. And I think the big thing, when I was doing rural health some years ago, uh, a mentor of mine was talking about the impression about country towns. And a lot of people go, oh, I've been to a country town. And he used to have this saying about, if you've been to one country town, and you've been to one country town. And I think that rings really true for me with the veterans. Um, my own experience around, uh, around the military was I joined at 15. I was very young. I, uh, I joined straight out of year 10, so I still haven't finished high school. Um, and you know, I, I left after six years, and I, I served during the Great Peace at a time when there weren't any conflicts, uh, thankfully. But that didn't mean we didn't train for them. And, and you know, if anything was to happen at the um, at the drop of a hat, we would have deployed accordingly. Um, and so, the thing that really strikes for me is that there are people on very different timelines, so far as the ages at which they serve, the length at which they serve, what they serve through, whether they serve through peace missions. Um, or humanitarian uh, missions or um, in active service uh, more recently. And, um, and therefore, they come with similar but different um, concerns. And from my own perspective, it's really great because um, as an Australian trained doctor um, with military experience, it gives me um, you know, instant rapport with the patient. But part of my introduction is to say that, you know, 
while we share some experiences, each of our journeys are very different and I don't expect them to understand mine and nor, nor me theirs. And I think that's really important as we move forward. Um, I think the other thing that sort of goes on here is that um, I, um, one of my mentors in, in Bundaberg some years ago was saying, why are you doing veterans health? They're a dying breed. And I mean, sadly, I suppose, um, they're certainly not a dying breed. I mean, I'm being inundated by a new generation of veterans that are coming back with all sorts of physical and mental health disturbances. And you know, you don't just inherit the patient, you, in, you inherit, or the veteran, you inherit the, um, the, the wider family and um, you know, the, the partners, the, uh, the children, the likes as well. And what, what comes out of Tom's story is that you know, he, his wife Sonia has had her own coping mechanisms during his various service, um, and it extends back to her father as well. Um, you know, she's had a lifelong exposure to military deployment, whether that be, um, you know, working uh, within Australia, working away from home, working overseas. And, um, and so she's learned to run the, the family on her own. And I think that's, um, you know, that, that's really important to, to think about. So Tom comes home and all of a sudden he feels disenfranchised from a family, he doesn't fit in. He's got his own coping mechanisms of how to get through the day as well. And so I think that we need to think about those when we're looking forward. One of the really important things that comes out for me that I see on a daily basis is the opportunity through open arms to actually refer the, um, the partners and the, uh, and the children uh, in, into the open arms process. Um, you know, accessing care can be an expense and if t people are struggling, um, you know, having access to, uh, to the likes of psychology services through open arms can be a real um, bonus and through our practice we have a, a psychologist working out of here and as, a, as an opportunity we're actually able to use the open arms process to engage her and that means that she gets the opportunity to uh, care for these people and, and work with them in a practice um, where, where they're actually quite comfortable. So it also assists me and my team in, um, in building that rapport and that comfort status with the, um, with the veteran and their family sort of wider, you know, moving ahead. Um, the other thing that I'm really um, aware of is that um, I have a patient at the moment who's going through a terrible strife and he was a young fellow when he joined the, uh, joined the army he um, came from a, a very um, well-to-do family, uh, had a great education, certainly wasn't experienced on the street and the like, went off on deployment to Afghanistan and got himself in a whole range of trouble while he was over there because he witnessed events that he was told he couldn't get involved in because they weren't allowed to get involved in local politics, understandably. As a result of that, we've prepared this fellow, we've trained him up to a heightened, heightened state of awareness and re response. And then we bring him home and we don't necessarily turn that, yeah. um, turn that situation off. And even if we do, I don't know that we turn it off well enough to give people the skills to be able to, um, to re-engage with civilian life. So as a result, he uh, got into a situation where um, his uh, partner was assaulted and he started to hit the fellow who did that and um, didn't know when to stop and ended up in prison. And I just find that the greatest travesty that um, this great guy and he's just the, such a gentle, meek sort of guy, but he saw a rage and, and um, responded in a way he didn't know how to stop. And we're working through that at the moment through PTSD training and, and retraining him generally so that he can get his life back. And um, you know, it's really wonderful to go on that journey with these guys. And I see some of that in Tom's story moving forward. Um, just, just moving forward, I think the, the thing is there's a whole lot of resources that I see as a veteran um, on Facebook as well. So there's the Overwatch program, the Veterans Promise program. There's, there's a whole lot of stuff where the veterans are actually out there doing things to support themselves. So the Overwatch program, for argument's sake, is, um, is over all three services, but there is a uh, Army, Navy and, um, and uh, Air Force uh, arm of those. And the idea is that um, they have people on the ground locally. There are people in Bundaberg. They can call me if there are um, uh, clinical uh, things that need to be sorted. And if someone gets into strife, it's actually about trying to get veterans involved in veterans care and um, you know, getting them to somewhere where they get uh, access to um, veteran friendly service. And I, I think that that's really important. So there's a lot of uh, services out there, but you've got to get people to places that have some understanding, have some appreciation. And if they don't, at least that they're open to 
um, for gaining that because there's a lot of resources available through DVA uh, for general practitioners and the community generally. Finding those can be a real challenge and uh, I think that we can um, certainly work towards uh, ways to, to make that better accessible and we, we certainly are. And my experience of DVA on a daily basis is that um, the guys are really keen to um, uh, find ways moving forward. A lot of the veterans come with um, tainted views of DVA over the years and, uh, and rightly so. I mean, it's been quite an arduous task in some ways. Um, I was going, going to pick up on that actually, uh, Brad, in just a minute, but can I ask you just sure. perhaps uh, one more minute maybe? Yeah, sure. And I, I think they're, um, they're important things as we move forward to, um, uh, to look at how we engage people through that process. And I think the other thing moving forward is that um, the thing that I notice is that there's, there's a very significant similarity, I think, to the work that I do around work cover in that often the process of getting people through their um, uh, claim for entitlements through DVA can be very much like work cover where people are actually having to deal with things that bring up issues around PTSD and the like. It often keeps them unwell until they, they get a, um, an end point. Um, and I think so as a result, the pathway for me certainly in getting someone to a, an entitlement decision with DVA can be very different to actually engaging with them on a pathway towards getting clinical outcomes and I think it's worthy of knowing that. And also I advise the veterans as we go through that, that part of this is that um, uh, they have an emotional um, connection with this and uh, they've got to go through an administrative process and turning that off can be really helpful on the way through, although it's very difficult. So um, I think that working them through that, guiding them through that, I find that it often takes a while, but if you spend the time with them, um, it's very rewarding and uh, on a daily basis I certainly see that. And um, uh, my practice is certainly um, you know, moving forward by maybe taking on veterans as we, uh, as we move ahead. So it's great stuff. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, Brad. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry to, to sort of hurry you along there. There are a whole range of issues that uh, I'd love to pick, well, we will pick up on actually in the discussion that you've raised there. So I will come back to you and expand on a few of those if we can. Uh, we need to move on now, though, because of the time. And uh, I'd like to perhaps hear something of a psychology perspective from Loretta and, and perhaps even something about what some of the research might tell us. So I'm not sure whether we've got a picture of you at the moment, Loretta, but either way, can I hand over to you for your, your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I don't know what's happened to the picture, but uh, uh, so in terms of engaging with a veteran, there's there's a lot going on for Tom at the moment. There are there are multiple levels of, uh, of, of loss and, um, and also to look at uh, what is happening for for Tom in terms of his transition out of the defence family and the, and that uh, uh, the I think the understanding that we're dealing with a a particular culture um, and a family, his the belongingness, the strong mateship, the strong values of professionalism, loyalty, integrity, courage, and teamwork, um, and very much a collective culture. Um, where the you know the the team is certainly emphasised above the individual, so it is something that um, as practitioners we really need to be mindful of that that we need to learn how to speak the language. Um, so it's sorry, I'm just trying to um, get the camera. Oh, there you go. I hope you can see me. So. Um, so it is about acknowledge, one acknowledging that there is a different culture, culture. There's, there's a, a there's a loss of identity, there's um, a, loss a loss of family, of family and, and, and what we call tribe, you know, the in-group, out-group. Group, out group. Um, um, and, that, and that this can uh, often uh, raise issues of, of feeling threatened and um, a, a real reluctance to accept that there is a, a change that's, you know, that's coming uh, towards him. So, and so, one, so part of this is uh, recognising the bond, but also acknowledging and recognising the service to his country. Um, in terms of the uh, losses, as I indicated before, that there there are multiple losses here. If you look at his family of origin, um, 
So we need to look at uh, what is happening for Tom on, on quite a number of levels. Um, the other, uh, I think, here is, is um, uh, understanding that for many people what we have is very much a um, in transitioning into the, into the defence force is a high level of training. They are trained to um, react to threats and to be focused on threats. So they're, they're uh, as uh, Brad said earlier, that their body is on um, you know a different thermostat. Their thermostat is actually up quite high, and in new situations, that that withdrawal. The isol you know, being isolated, the coping strategy of, of using alcohol, the, the uh, sleep, the disruption to sleep, all these things tell us that there is, um, uh, you know, there's dysregulation, and you know, part of that, is, part of my, uh, was engaging with Tom is about understanding that this is a normal response. And that he has been, and this is what uh, a lot of people do tell us that are transitioning out, is that you've trained us to uh, to go to combat, to have these very high, temp you know, in these high tempo situations, but you don't train us how to um, reintegrate back into civilian, into the civilian world. Um, so it is important to prepare Tom for change. And it's interesting that in the UK they actually talk about a cultural awareness training um, for the civilian world, um, and that's, that's an, and it's an interesting, I think, concept and something that that the Canadian Armed Forces are looking at a quite a lengthy uh, transition um, training course for all people transitioning out of um, out of uh, their defence force. So. Uh, so, in part of uh, engaging with someone, needs to to uh, be mindful of the culture, be mindful of talking um, defence language, and there. Uh, so, it's about motivating. How do we look at the pros and cons for Tom of continuing on the path that he's that he's on, or looking at um, uh, usually, you know, uh, being uh, I suppose acknowledging and accepting that change is is happening, and that how does he prepare for that that shift? Um, what are the skills that he needs to to have? Um, how does he engage in his family of origin? Um, so it's for his his current family. So these are the the conversations, and it's also about education. And this is where the transition and wellbeing research program is really. Uh, important. We know that family uh, and friends are really critical to uh, to bring people uh, to um, uh, uh, to uh, treatment uh, and to seek help. But we also know, in terms of the defence culture, there is a you know strong sense of uh, I can do it on my own. I'm invincible. And so there are a lot of layers of of um, of uh, training and and expectations and and um, values that really uh, uh, we as practitioners really need to to be mindful of how that is actually impacting on um, a person's ability or or um, I suppose um, uh, um, I don't know what the word is they they and um, Feeling of safety with with us as practitioners. Do we understand? We know from um, again the, the research that uh, military people do engage uh, better with practitioners and with services that they feel are veteran aware, and that is really critical. I think that we understand that that's um, something that we need to be. Um, I suppose educating ourselves on, and it's so the cultural awareness training is not just for people leaving defence, but also for for um, people working in this area to understand the the cultural nuances um, that that are going to help us uh, uh, take be that bridge, I suppose, for for um, uh, members leaving defence to. Um, uh, 
to help them through and to create a sense of purpose and um, and safety and also uh, expectation around what uh, being in the civilian world is about. We understand that also that, that um, you know cities uh, for defence personnel are, are difficult uh, uh, in terms of. Of, of how they see uh, the um, civilian culture, uh, so it is important to uh, to really be that that bridge for them, and and um, also I think involving family members. We know, and as I've said before, we've um, uh, from the Transition and Wellbeing Research Program, the Family Wellbeing Study certainly indicated that, and the Pathways to Care that. Um, that support uh, is really critical. And we'll try and pick up on some of that, Loretta. Can I just give you get just one more minute, perhaps? Yes. So uh, again, it's knowing the research. Uh, Dr. Paula Davovich's research on transition and the key. She looks at the key issues of uh, identity and values, and sees the transition out of defence as the third stage of development. Um, and so uh, we. That, which is a great, I think, a really uh, uh, useful way of, of seeing that um, that transition um, piece. Um, access to treatment, I think, uh, hopefully, we that all come up in the discussion, um, and that's it. Lovely. Okay. Thank you very much, Loretta. Thanks very much indeed. Um, and again, there's a whole range of questions there that I would love to follow up on, and we will in the discussion. Um, thanks very much for that. But at this point, I'm going to hand over to Duncan to get a psychiatry perspective and uh, perhaps a current military perspective. So, Duncan, uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Mark. So, uh, when I looked at Tom's case, the, what the factors that stood out uh, for me uh, were the withdrawal, from, his withdrawal from the family, uh, the the occurrence of repeated disturbing memories of a stressful past experience feeling ashamed and nervous and irritable and the insomnia that he was managing with alcohol concerningly, plus the history of a disabling musculoskeletal injury. All of these factors, I thought, uh, were suggestive of the presence of a mental disorder and should alert a clinician that, uh, that he was experiencing significant problems. So I'm looking on the next slide, this led me to uh, construct a differential diagnosis of uh, of possible uh, uh, conditions that he might be experiencing, uh, one or more, and these include uh, chronic post-traumatic stress disorder, major depressive disorder, an alcohol use disorder, an adjustment disorder with, sec with uh, anxiety and depression secondary to his uh, severe ankle injury, and panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder. And remember, panic disorder, panic attacks can sometimes be the first presentation of uh, PTSD, so it's uh, important to always keep that in mind that it might have might be part of a of, a, of another condition as well. So, looking at uh, my next slide, um, part of my response was to uh, to, to really uh, hone in on his strong sense of identity in the army, and this was especially drawn from his father-in-law, who was a really his father figure. Uh, because of his, the early loss of his father with a severe alcohol problem and, and the loss of his mother as well. So I was also particularly concerned at the feelings of shame at his potential loss of his military identity and those sort of feelings can sometimes be associated with suicidal ideas so that was uh, starting to, to flash a bit of a red, uh, red alert for me as well. I think it's important not to underestimate, as Loretta was saying, the strength and meaning of military culture that's imbued in members of all branches on, of the Defence Force. And if we look at my next slide, it's, uh, it's, uh, it shows a copy of the Australian Army's contract with Australia. And this is uh, a mantra, as it were, for Australian soldiers. So while you're reading it, I'll just uh, uh, mention that what the mother of a young soldier uh, that, I was, uh, that I saw is being discharged from the Army with a very severe mental disorder. He'd only been in for three years. But she said to me, when's he going to get over this soldier stuff? And uh, I had to break it to her that, uh, that this soldier stuff uh, is, runs pretty deep. It's, it's pretty much on the hard drive. And when you see this uh, contract with Australia, you can see the intensity of the feelings that, that are associated with that. 
So then my, my next slide then also uh, emphasizes the importance about military, military culture and how clinicians need to be competent in mil understanding mil military culture in assessing and treating serving members and veterans. Uh, it's, it's not essential, but it's certainly desirable. And learning about it is not as difficult as you may think. It's uh, obviously easier for Brad and I because we've had many years of military experience. But if you're a clinician without uh, that sort of uh, history, then there, there's certainly other ways to, to pick it up. And I think the best ways to do so are to ask your patients about their work, their role in the military in a bit of detail. What exactly did they do? What sort of hours did they work? How, was it shift work or did they have long hours of on-call where they're being called back for ceremonial duties, uh, eating into their, their own personal time? How much time did they have to spend away from home out in the field on exercises? And that's uh, irrespective of their history of deployment as well, which is part of the full service history that I recommend that you take the next step uh, finding out what recruit training was like for them, what was their initial employment training when they learned to become an infantry soldier or a, a radar operator, whatever, the postings that they had in different uh, uh, garrison uh, Australian places, and then their deployments overseas, the nature of their deployments, whether they were combat or humanitarian assistance or peacekeeping, and also a bit about their history of promotion, whether they were promoted early, whether they were promoted late, or whether they were promoted uh, not at all as, uh, as, a, as a, a patient of mine who'd been a private for 33 years, which also says a little bit about the, the members as well. When your patients start talking about in acronyms and using jargon, ask them about it. What do they mean? Don't let it slide. So I think if you, if you uh, take that approach, you'll be able to fully engage with the patient and you'll pick up a great deal uh, about the military culture as well. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much indeed, Duncan. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a really interesting point you've ended on there, that um, you don't necessarily have to be a, an ex-service or a veteran to treat veterans, but you do have to have that kind of understanding and the cultural competence, I think, is a very nice way of putting it. Can yes. I come back to one of your slides, though, um, where you were talking about, uh, you looked at sort of differential diagnoses, and I guess we're saying that at the moment, Tom may not even meet a diagnosis. Of course. But these are some of the things that we might look at. Um, and given that the diagnosis is not black and white, it's not necessarily either you've got it or you haven't, uh, people talk about subsyndromal conditions and particularly subsyndromal PTSD. Can you comment on, on, on that, I guess, and, and, and whether that's relevant for us when we're, we're looking at military and veteran populations? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. I think it's really important, and the more we know with the high quality research going on, that subsyndromal PTSD is, is, is important. So, what is it? There's no, there's no specific definition, but basically it's somebody who's been exposed to trauma, they've got a degree of symptoms and a degree of impairment, but they haven't got enough to, to make the cut, as it were, to become a full case of PTSD. Now, we know that um, this is still significant to have subsyndromal PTSD. We know yeah. that, that, that it's associated with also emerging features of altered neurobiology, and it's also associated with a range of physical health conditions like musculoskeletal conditions, respiratory and GIT uh, disorders uh, in comparison to control groups as well. And significantly, it's also associated with uh, delayed onset PTSD in military populations especially. It's also in civilian populations, but in military populations especially. So we think it's really significant. And we think that it's an opportunity to perhaps uh, engage in some early interventions and, and early treatment as well. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you, Duncan. I quite agree. I think it is important. And, and I guess as clinicians, uh, we, we, need to be, we need to be cautious about the way we use diagnoses and not assume that just because someone doesn't get across the line that they don't benefit from help, as you're saying. And as we go to talk about Tom, in fact, that I think will come up uh, repeatedly in our discussion. So let's move now to the broader discussion, if we could, and, and I'm going to ask our panel members to jump in uh, whenever they've got something to add or indeed to, to provide an alternative perspective or indeed to disagree with each other. That's perfectly fine as well. Um, in order to do that, we, we've, we've had a number of questions from uh, our participants, and I'd like to thank you very much indeed for all the questions you've sent in. We've got some very intriguing ones there. 
Uh, we will try to get to as many as possible, but please bear with us if we don't uh, necessarily get to your question. As a start, though, and really as a bit of fun, what we've done is to uh, take four questions from the selection that you sent in, four questions that kind of um, represent, if you like, some slightly broader themes. And so we're going to um, run a kind of poll as a bit of fun. So you can see on your screen now what the questions are. So the first question is, uh, what can the general community do better, uh, sorry, ha yeah, to, to support members and veterans? And I'm going to use my prerogative as a facilitator there to expand that one to include not only the general community, but also what can DVA do better, what can ADF do better, uh, what can perhaps the ex-service organizations do better. The second question is, what types of counseling models do veterans favor? And I'm going to expand that out to look at treatment more broadly, um, what helps, what works, uh, not only just what veterans favor. The third one is about how do we better advocate for and support veterans who don't fit the traditional hero story? I think that's a very interesting question. And I guess what it's doing is raising a whole lot of um, issues around the expectations we have about what a real soldier is or what a real man is or you know what, what a veteran should or shouldn't be like. So that's the third one. And our fourth one is, uh, again, an interesting one about what are the differences in the impact of combat experiences versus humanitarian experiences? And I'm going to expand that out to have a discussion more broadly about the different types of clinical presentation that we might see. So can I ask Renan now to start the poll, please? And we'll let the poll run for 30 seconds. You've got 30 seconds to vote. It looks to me as though you've already started voting, actually, uh, which is fine. Um, I'm not promising that we will necessarily do the one that comes out top uh, first, because it might depend on, on uh, doing things in a sensible order, but we'll certainly make sure that we spend some time looking at the one that you, uh, you want most. So if I can ask Renan to bring up the final results, and uh, it looks to me as though the uh, most popular by far, actually, is the one about what kinds of treatment do veterans favor. And as I say, we're going to expand that one out a little bit to um, uh, to look more broadly, I guess, at, at uh, treatment and intervention. Um, look, I think that maybe, and I know that, that we should start with the second one, but why don't we start in order there and look first of all at what the general community and what DVA can do better, and then that will slide us naturally into treatment, uh, and we'll spend a bit of time on that. I hope that's okay with you. So let's move on then and have that um, discussion. If uh, I'm just going to try and move the slides back one. Uh, if we could have that discussion now, and perhaps if I could ask um, you, Brad, first of all, um, we, we talked about um, the difficulties of engaging people with DVA. I think you mentioned this in your talk. And generally speaking, if we look at Tom, he's someone who seems to want to kind of isolate himself a bit. Um, I'm wondering whether you, you've got any comments, Brad, on um, from your perspective, what we can do to help Tom or someone like him engage both with the the DVA and the broader community. Yeah, thanks, Mark. W what really strikes me, I think, is um, we can get caught up in various um, how models fit and whether it's CBT or the, or the the like. But what these guys, the guys and gals, respond to is trust and feeling safe. How you deliver it, I don't think, really matters in one respect if they actually trust you. And I've had some really great experiences with guys recently. I had a, we had our own dawn service here at the practice this year, and I had a fellow come along to that. He came and saw me two days later uh, on a Saturday, and he said, "You know, I, I really feel safe here, and I want to talk to you about what actually triggers my PTSD." And he's been a patient of mine for two years. So I think that if you can work towards, I mean, you know, I've got some relationship there because of military experience. But the relationship really is about taking the time, and it's often time in general practice you don't have, but you've got to take the time to get to know these guys, take the time to listen to the stories of the families along the way, um, take the time to get involved with the children as well because you know, these guys are all very pertinent parts of this journey. And I think DBA, we, we need to continue the great work that's already happened. We need to get this message out there. I think that um, there's all sorts of ways we can do it. Uh, I'd love to see a, um, a practitioner or information line set up so that the guy in Thargaminda West could ring up and say, geez, I've got this veteran, I really don't know what to do with him. Can you give me a bit of a hint? There's so many things you can do. These guys can get anything they want. 
in, in lots of ways you can put an argument forward, things like antidepressant therapy and the likes. If you've got a, a range of things that haven't worked, there's a lot of stuff that's not on the PBS that if you can demonstrate that they've tried various things, you can um, you can get things often um, that aren't available. And I think if we yeah. can do that and do it well, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to pick up on a point that you made there very quickly, um, support from for clinicians, I would remind people that the Anzac Centre at, the, at Phoenix, Australia has a support service for clinicians that you can just ring up and get expert advice from uh, experienced psychiatrists and psychologists and whatever. So, so that is there. But I, I think the really important point you make there, Brad, is about the need to develop the therapeutic relationship, to develop trust with the person in order to engage them. Can I come to you, Loretta, and ask, because we're talking mm -hmm. about how the community can kind of support. Um, ask more broadly about families. And Brad, in his talk, actually gave us some nice, some nice examples about the challenges faced by families. But do you think it's important to try to engage the family and perhaps even uh, peers in, in supporting the veteran through, through their process? Oh, absolutely critical. And I think that this is one area where uh, through um, uh, the department is currently going through a trans what we call transformation and we are uh, using co-design principles to engage both veterans and family members to to design the programs and, um, and that uh, and also uh, defense as well and so we're we're looking at ways that we uh, that we as a department can engage but also uh, as clinicians we under, you know understand that how important that is because it is that support and research, uh, has you know, uh, told us and has been very clear that, that it, you know, it's the family members that reorientate or a family and friends that reorientate the person to the civilian world and so uh, they are a really important uh, bridge uh, to, to that um, uh, reorientation. The, um, the other is, uh, I mean, peer support is also becoming very um, important and we have open arms are actually in the process of uh, um, rolling out a national peer support program. They've had great success in Townsville, uh, Sydney and Canberra um, with utilising peer support workers. They're almost like a, a tran transitional object. Um, they, they help engage veterans wherever they are in the community. They, they go to hospitals, they work with, um, uh, open, uh, with uh, uh, Soldier On, Mates for Mates and other ESOs who are critical in this, in this pathway as well to, um, to enable them to get to a point where they feel safe, where they feel um, uh, I, I suppose the, the um, motivation to then take that next step and so the peer workers as the family and friends help um, get veterans to uh, to uh, the help that they that they need. So they're really critical in that pathway to care. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, just taking that one step further, Duncan, if I could bring you in. Um, yes. I, I guess that that um, a lot of guys like Tom seem to fall between the gaps, as it were. And I'm wondering, are there any more structured kind of ways that we can um, that we can try and stop that happening? Uh, any ways to stop losing them from the system? Well, firstly, I'd just like to uh, comment on uh, um, what, what you were asking Loretta about. I think it's really important to have the spouse in the assessment. Uh, it's a routine part of my clinical approach to always ask the spouse. And remember, it's not always a wife because we're getting young female veterans. It's very important to get their partners in, at least for the assessment. And I certainly always have the door open to... Uh, to them attending a, a, at subsequent consultations. So coming back to your other question, how do we stop people falling through the gaps? It's, it, it's really important that uh, people get a, get a GP when they, before they finish, uh, uh, before they transition out. I think that's really important. There's a special DVA item number for an extended consultation so they can sit down and have a look at their whole record and have some mental health checks as well. I think that's a really good, good start. Uh, I think the ex-service organisations, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, quite a number of them now which are also appealing to younger veterans which are doing a number of outreach programs that, to try to, to link them in as well. So it's, there's no foolproof uh, answer to this. I think uh, 
The other uh, thing that Veterans Affairs is, is engaging in is trying to get people uh, become a DVA uh, client uh, from their entry into defence and, uh, and right, right from recruit school and uh, to make everybody uh, known to DVA rather than, uh, than having to put their hand up at times when they're maybe not predisposed to, to seeking help. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I was, I was going to ask um, Loretta there, um, is it likely that Tom would have had any contact with DVA while he was still serving? Uh, yes, yes, we have. Um, the DVA has on base, um, uh, we call them OBAS, uh, uh, representatives, so they are actually on defence bases and they provide information about services that, um, that DVA uh, um, can help them with, uh, and uh, of course, when when uh, some people uh, are leaving the um, defence, they have compensation claims they want to um, start. So what? Uh, and one of the I, I think the, the things that we have improved a lot is that trying to get the whole um, health record and the compensation claim in the in the um, uh, through our system before they um, uh, discharge and uh, because that is a source as you can imagine of, uh, of um, tension and, uh, and worry for people so uh, through uh, we had a what we call my service which is a new portal on the DBA website that has uh, that can do some straight through claiming as well so the OBAS are, are great um, open arms is on uh, is on some bases as well, and they of course run the um, stepping out program for transitioning uh, members. And uh, there's also a trial at the moment uh, for transitioning members called SOAR, which is a, a, um, a, a an attention reset uh, trial that is um, happening on some of the bases as well. Okay, so there's a whole lot of stuff there available for them, isn't there? And um, hopefully, mm. I'm sure all of this stuff will be available in the resources section for participants when they come back afterwards and have a look. Um, yes. But I guess it is about, uh, and, and perhaps come back to you, Brad, to talk about this, that it is about um, helping people to be aware, as, as you said in your talk, of these various services. Because I, would you agree that, that um, uh, I guess as Loretta was saying, that the process of applying for a DVA claim can be very stressful for veterans? Oh, yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right, Mark. I mean, one of the things is if you look over the, um, over the longevity of time, people find out about DVA at various times and often very late. In the, so if you look at some of the Vietnam veterans, certainly, you know, there was no such thing as on-base on um, advice and the like. Um, I, I actually did uh, read a, a department within the Navy that um, sort of coordinated people out of the service on medical discharge. And I learned about DVA after I got out of the Navy. So, um, you know, I think there's various experiences. And um, so while DVA is really good at some of the resources, some people don't know about that. Mates for mates are awesome. There's a whole range of them. And I don't want to give preference to any one of them because they're all really good. The problem, I suppose, for me in, in the rural area, and I used to be very remote, but now um, uh, I'm regional. But, um, you know, they're available in different areas at different degrees. I've got people that still travel back to Brisbane to get their health care with our practice and Mates for Mates is very strong and the stuff that they're able to achieve there is awesome. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know, group activity around Bundaberg that allows them to, to gather and have coffee and tea and, and bring the families along and you know it's, it's exactly what the guys were saying. Um, you often get the truth from the partner. Um, it's a different sort of truth. Mm -hmm. It's obviously his, hers and the truth. Um, but you know that's that role is really important and without that you're only getting one side of the story and you have some opportunity. And I think yeah. the other thing that's really strong that I just wanted to make a point about is that people have these very interesting experiences and PTSD is probably one of the big ones for me that people often start to address it after they get out of the, the service because identifying and acknowledging you've got a problem with PTSD in the service means that your career is likely to be stilted and, um, and, and held up. And I've got lots of experience with that. A lot of people who use uh, open arms as it is now because that is still a confidential uh, way of accessing care. But sometimes their first discussions around PTSD happen after. The other thing is the diagnosis is really important for their DBA entitlement. 
it's not important from my point of view in that some of these guys are in trouble and that's all that's really important. Putting a label on it isn't as important as recognising the need to access care. Yeah, I think it's a, that's a very important point. And as you rightly point out, you know, uh, our needs as a clinician are not necessarily the same as the needs for compensation or indeed if we're working in medico-legal settings and the, the, um, the diagnosis becomes very important. But that point you raised um, is exactly what I was going to ask you a little bit later. So you foreshadowed it and I might still come back to it about the the difficulty of acknowledging these problems while the person is still serving. Let me though um, come back to the question that people did uh, specifically look for um, uh, an answer for, which was around counselling models, therapy models, treatment, whatever you want to call it. And um, Loretta, let me um, ask you specifically about the question that was on the on the slide there, which is, do you think that veterans tend to favour or avoid certain types of counselling or therapy? Uh, in your experience, is, are there some that they're willing to engage in, and some they're not? No, I think I think it's a I think it's an interesting it's an interesting question because the, it really does depend on on the relationship that that uh, once you do establish safety, and we have said that quite a few times uh, uh, tonight that um, if if um, your client or patient trusts you and they think that you know what you're doing then um, that is a big factor. The other thing, um, as a, a clinician, sometimes I could be, you know, um, the uh, cognitive processing therapy just doesn't, it just, so I go to EMDR. One uses whatever is going to work. And so as a clinician, I think we do need to, to have a, you know, a broad toolkit of evidence-based treatments that, um, that, that we bring out and, and you know, with one client, uh, he wouldn't write, but he would draw. So I bring in, you know, so we'd have a session, and he would sit and draw this particular scene, and and would really engage with it. And he was totally, uh, and and it, so he would love coming to sessions. So he yeah. really, um, it, it, it's uh, as long as uh, and that emotion regulation is really critical, and I think it's really where what I'm seeing, even talking to psychiatrists and. Um, and psychologists that 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 is really uh, a key thing for uh, for for any uh, uh, anyone that we engage with is uh, are those skills and that's Marsha Linehan's or it's the STAIR program. Yeah, absolutely, I agree, I agree entirely. And I guess what what I would like to do tonight is not um, is not go too far down the track of treatment for established conditions. Although I, you know, I take your point about the the. the types of intervention that you raise. I'm really not, uh, pleased though that so far we've been spending a lot of time talking about the various other supports and services that are available to Tom, uh, even though he might not necessarily be getting involved in strict mental health care. Although I do agree with your point there about emotion regulation, that it seems to me this is something that at this stage he, he could benefit from a lot. Um, Brad, if I could bring you in, you know, because you're the GP, you, you, you're seeing Tom first. Given his presentation, do you think it's premature to be linking him in with a, a specialist mental health service at this stage, or um, what, what, what do you think the next steps might be for Tom, Brad? I, I think it's about talking to Tom. I mean, I, I do in that I have a range of psychologists that I refer to that are veteran friendly. I've got a range of psychologists that are veteran spouse friendly. I've got psychiatrists that I use via Skype. And they are just awesome, and uh, one of those allows me to then um, gear them towards a PTSD course. And surprising how many of these guys are guilty. Well, I don't have PTSD, I can't do that course. And yet they just give them the skills to re-engage with, uh, with community. And, you know, you, you just wouldn't... Um, you would, I've been out of the Navy for 35 years, and it could just as well be yesterday. Um, and when you look at the way that people engage, and the fact that these guys often feel guilty about what they've seen, what they've been involved in, you know, various things that have happened through their service. And, and you know, I have the same experience with, with my service and with the, um, the ambulance. And I don't want to share that with my wife. I mean, I don't want my frame of reference to become hers. I mean, it's, you know, it's a terrible thing. I carry that and I've dealt with it. I don't want to share that with my wife. So who do I talk to? 
And I think this is an opportunity to establish that safe ground and whether that's with the, um, with the GP or with the, uh, the psychologists and likes that you refer to, depending on what you've got. When I was out bush, there were no psychology referrals available. Now, of course, with technology, there's access to a lot of this stuff and I think we need to make ourselves aware of what is available. And the other great opportunity that I've got is I get the chance to be involved. So if we do teleconferencing, I can sit in with, with the, um, the permission and obviously you don't go down that road without it, but I can be involved in that and so we're all part of the same journey. People aren't telling the same story over and over and you become part of that journey and safety mm. and the trust that comes from that and I think that is just invaluable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to put you on the spot, do you, uh, would you envisage giving uh, Tom any kind of medication at this stage? You're going to give him something to help him sleep? I'm going to hand over to Duncan in just a minute, but I'm interested in your perspective, Brad, for the GP. Something to help him sleep, or are you going to start him on any antidepressants? Or anything? I think it's about getting uh, getting to the bottom of all this, and, uh, and particularly around the alcohol use. It's about what he's comfortable with as well, because a lot of these guys will say, to, well, I don't want to take pills. So I think it's about getting to a point where you're comfortable. I think that um, if you had 10 patients in the room, the answer would be different. I think sleeping pills have a role. It's not one of my favourites, but it absolutely has a role. Um, sometimes you need to make sure that you engage the family in making sure that the administration of these is done safely if you think there's any chance of self-harm and the like. So I think it's, an, it's a case-by-case -case scenario, but I think there's absolutely a role that the patient has to be on board because otherwise they won't take them. The other thing is that there's a great opportunity here, some Balta for argument's sake, great opportunity to sell that to the patient on, on its basis of its side effect profile of helping around pain. And you know, I've had personal experience with it myself. I've had a spinal fusion and uh, been on some Balta years back and it actually was tremendous at helping with my back pain. So I think that you know, there's opportunities here to look at side effect profiles. We sell it around insomnia and, and helping them sleep with the likes of metazapine. So I think if you know your, your pharmacop uh, pharmacopoeia that's available to you, there's great opportunities to sell that. So it's not just about, I think you're mad, because if you've got the trust, it's not about that. It's about helping their symptoms. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And I guess a repeated theme that you've said a number of times, Brad, but I think others have said as well, is the importance of um, Intervention being a collaborative process, you're sitting down, you're talking to, the, to, to your patient or to the veteran uh, and perhaps their family and working out what's best for each individual case rather than one size fits all. So I agree, I think it's a very important point. But can I bring you in, Duncan, as the psychiatrist and expert yes. here? Um, yes. well, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts with someone like Tom about whether medication's appropriate and or whether referral to a specialist mental health person is. Sure, I'm not, I'm, I wouldn't be there at medication just yet. I think he needs, a, as Brad was saying, he needs a comprehensive assessment uh, with some screens, like a PCL. Uh, if you really think it's uh, PTSD, then I would be looking to get a capstone, a clinician-administered PTSD scale to get that diagnostic accuracy involved. And then I think you explain the range of treatments. Uh, the, the evidence base shows that, uh, that psychotherapies have a stronger evidence base, so they'd be my first options if they don't have a comorbid depressive disorder uh, and, and uh, em emphasising that trauma-focused psychotherapies or EMDR are, are number one before coming to uh, the, the medication options. Yeah, okay, sounds great. Yeah. And just for the benefit of participants, um, I've got a sneaking suspicion that Tom's not going to do very well and that in a couple of weeks' time, <laughs> we're going to be talking quite a lot about those kinds of treatments. So if you're interested in those, come back in a fortnight. Um, Loretta, how important do you think some kind of uh, occupational rehab is for Tom? Is it important to um, try and help him to get into some kind of meaningful uh, employment or, or you know, voluntary or, or paid? Yes, it's one of the, um, and if you're looking at, uh, as uh, I think both the Department of Defence and DVA, looking at more of wellbeing um, focus, which is the, you know, the, the uh, social determinants of health, we know employment, um, and also that, that, that new sense of purpose is, is really um, critical. So Defence has um, the Career Transition Centre, I think it's called. Um, the, uh, our department has um, the Prime Minister's um, it, you know, em employment program which has been incredibly successful and, and uh, through the uh, our rehabilitation um, uh, section in, within the department we've had some really good 
success stories. Um, but I think for Tom, that um, uh, in, in engaging, it, again, it's that motivation. Where is the hook here that's going to get him to therapy and to and 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 to help him look at planning? What's you know, where does he want to be in twelve months' time? And also to, you know, and that's where that emotion regulation really needs. We need to get him into a state where he doesn't see threats at every at every turn. So you know, to get that thermostat uh, to a point. And whether that's bringing the wife in, um, we know with um, uh, with uh, open arms that a lot of um, we, we have uh, a lot of people coming along for for relationship counselling. Uh, so it is um, it is that purpose, but employment is key. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, let's move on to the third question, which was about the perception of you know not not being a hero or not living up to the expectations or whatever. And uh, Brad, you you made some very important points earlier about um, the difficulty of acknowledging this stuff while you're still serving. Um, perhaps I'll bring Duncan in here. Is, is that still a problem, Duncan, do you think? Is it still um, an issue that people would be frightened about the impact on their career to acknowledge mental health issues? Yes, I think it always is. People worry that uh, they're not going to make that next deployment, that they're not going to be promoted. What will people think of me? People will think I'm weak. I think that's a constant uh, uh, concern and it's certainly been borne out in the recent uh, Pathways to Care report from the Transitional Wellbeing Research Program uh, from the Centre for Traumatic Stress Studies, uh, University of Adelaide. So that's a constant uh, problem. But having said that, we know that, uh, that those barriers to care like that can generate stigma. But we know that uh, people who do have mental disorders uh, have the highest rates of stigma, which is very strange. But we, we know that often that doesn't hold them back from seeking care. So. It's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag. It's one of those sort of go figure situations. It, it is, isn't it? I, I agree. It's much more complex than it looks at first sight, isn't it? Yes. But, but nevertheless, I think anything we can do to reduce stigma. Um, Brad, if I could ask you, um, in some ways, Tom is kind of a, um, a fairly traditional kind of veteran. He's a male. He's sort of, you know, young middle age. He's heterosexual. He's got a wife and kids. Um, do you think, though, that the, the, the veteran population is changing over the years? Are we seeing different kinds of veterans now? Um, are we seeing different kinds? I served in the Navy at a time that we bought a, um, bought a cruise ship uh, and uh, renamed it HMAS Jarvis Bay so that we could have uh, female toilets and showers. So and they were the first uh, sailors, female sailors to go and see. Yeah. So, um, and homosexuality was something you got kicked out for because the Russians might find out and get all our secrets. And in my case, they would have known all of my antibiotic, um, um, you know, prescribing, I suppose. Like, so it's absolutely changed. And um, so, I, and it's a different world. I mean, you know, when when I went on deployment, I'd send a um, send a letter home to to mum or what have you, and take three weeks turnaround. You know, people aren't just emailing anymore, they're Skyping from overseas and the like. So, you know, the opportunity to stay in touch with family is different to some degree. So, I mean, we're in a very different world and, I mean, the opportunity to use that both within and, and, and after the service, I think, is, you know, really a, a great opportunity. And these guys are coming out with skills that, um, you yeah, that, that I'm... Well, they challenge me to keep up to date. Mm. Yeah. That's right. So, so, so we are looking at a much um, broader kind of population, perhaps, than we have in the past in terms of gender and age and a whole range of other things. Um, let's go on to our last question, which is an interesting one. Uh, and I'll deal with the specific question in a minute. Um, before we address that, can we have a more general chat about the presentation? And um, Duncan, you had a nice slide about what you saw as being the warning signs in um, Tom's presentation. Is there anything yes. that you would add to that? Uh, that perhaps you didn't see in Tom's. What, what are you? What are your key go-to warning signs when someone walks in? Well, I think it's uh, um, levels of, of symptoms. Uh, certainly, psychomotor agitation, um, levels of risk, risk of harm to self, risk of harm to others, uh, and and also when they have comorbid pain conditions, which is pretty common, as with Tom with a musculoskeletal injury, very often 
the guys particularly uh, have a number of painful musculoskeletal conditions which in themselves will, will disable them. Throw in a, a, uh, an alcohol problem and if you get that uh, complex comorbidity, that's when it's really starting to become uh, very concerning. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really important point, isn't it, that um, that interaction between physical injury or physical pain and, and then uh, exacerbating the PTSD in a kind of vicious downward spiral is so important. So, yeah, I, yes. I agree entirely. Okay. Um, Loretta, do you have any pet uh, sort of signs that you would look for as being warning signs when someone walks through the door? Um, I think that uh, the avoidance coping strategy and the... Um, uh, again, uh, you know, we're talking about continuum. But one of the things I, I think that we uh, that we fall into the trap of, and it's been talked about uh, around the, the research, the transition and wellbeing program, is the the sub syndromal. So there really is um, something here that says do not um, uh, uh, think that just because a person does not meet criteria. That, uh, that we shouldn't be doing some early intervention and that's really critical because we know from the research that it does develop over time and it does escalate after transition and of course if you're medically discharged then you know you've got multiple uh, factors there that indicate that there is uh, you know need for support so I'm very uh, and we're, we're getting a stronger evidence base around uh, prevention but of course you know it's often difficult to research that area and what has been but um, that early intervention we have very strong uh, a strong um, evidence base that uh, that if we intervene there we will get uh, results absolutely and of course that that is our challenge with Tom isn't it our challenge with Tom mm. is to see if we can intervene now and prevent that downward spiral into chronic long-term disabling kind of conditions um, so if we do what you've all said tonight, I'm sure he's going to be okay. Um, can I just finish it, Brad, uh, just very, very quickly? Do you have any particular red flag signs that you, uh, over and above what people have said so far, that you would be particularly concerned about when someone walks in? Two quick points for you, Mark. I think um, the telltale sign for me, because I have patients that I see for a lifetime, I hope, um, the, the, the telltale sign for me is when they say, oh, look, there are other people that are more important than me that you know you're really busy so you know you see them so when they stop coming that's that's my telltale sign that's hard because if they fall yeah. off the radar you forget the other thing is that complex relationship between pain and uh, and mental health and I, I get that all the time and, and I spend a lot of time talking with my patients around that because it's about understanding that I don't think they're mad I don't think they're putting it on even if I catch them and I certainly have walk a, Walking in from the car park, and then of course you know walk normally, and then they they um, you know uh, uh, much more painful when they get in. Um, the link between pain and mental health is really important. The treatment is very different. It doesn't mean it's not real. It's just that you know maybe instead of increasing their narcotics, maybe it's about giving them fish and chips on the beach. And I think once you can sort of acknowledge that and help them along the way, because narcotics aren't the um, aren't the answer. And these guys have got 40 years worth of treatment. You know, you can only increase the narcotics so far before you actually get to the real issues. So we try and get to it early. Yeah, good. Very good advice. Very good advice. Um, who am I going to pick on? Uh, I think I'm going to pick on Duncan for the, this particular question, which was, come back to what, the, the one on the slide, which was what are the differences in the impact of combat experiences versus humanitarian? Uh, Duncan, I think I'm right in saying that we don't have anything in the way of solid data but what's your clinical do you have any clinical experience yeah. about whether these are different yeah look i think you'd need a, a, a literature thorough literature search to drill down into this and i think you could expand it a bit more by having combat operations peacekeeping operations in, and humanitarian uh, assistance operations mm -hmm. and i think that it, it's it's all about the nature of their experience um, that, that what they're exposed to. So you get uh, people in an infantry unit who are going to be exposed to a, a number of firefights on a particular deployment. You've got people in special forces, they might be exposed to 30 or 40 firefights during the same deployment. And you get people in a, in a cruisy peacekeeping operation and then you get somebody who's been to Rwanda which has got extremely high rates of uh, PTSD because of the nature of what they're exposed to. And, and again, about humanitarian experience. 
humanitarian assistance operations. What we were exposed to, for example, on, on Operation Sumatra Assist is, is very different from what the, uh, the Indonesian TNI soldiers were exposed to who, who did the actual body recovery and, uh, and burial of, uh, of a quarter of a million people. So I think it's, it's PTSD uh, is going to be a little bit different because of, the it is because of the nature of the exposure and the nature of the exposure varies significantly w with the different types of operations I've described. Yeah, absolutely. So we can't draw any hard and fast rules. I, I, I think it's absolutely right. And I'd love to start yes. getting into the area of things like um, moral injury and, and rules of engagement, but we can't. So we won't go there. Unfortunately, we're running right out of time. I should say that I have been allowed to run over by a couple of minutes because we had the uh, video at the beginning, but I am conscious that we're out of, uh, running out of time now. So um, it was a fascinating discussion. I would just like to ask each of our panelists if they would like to give any final take-home messages for participants, just one or two dot points. Uh, Brad, anything uh, that you would like to leave our participants with? Uh, you're on mute, I think, Brad. Ah, there we go. <laughs> yep. three, three quick points for you. I did say I was challenged by the technology. Um, everyone's different. Everyone's different. The same as any other aspect of care, but everyone's different. Treat them as so. The veterans part of a team. Don't forget the um, the, the family and uh, and the, the peers. And the other thing is that if you're um, if you're not sure whether you're making a difference, I guarantee you are. And uh, I got a Christmas text from a mother who said, thanks for giving me my son back, um, who otherwise wouldn't have been here because of suicide, a very serious suicide attempt. And I think, you know, you just got to take that time and spend the time, get to know them and um, you know, do what you're taught. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Brad. Thank you. Um, Loretta, any uh, take home messages from you? I think that, uh, well, uh, that for me, it is about reiterating that um, to, to think about trauma around the cumulative uh, um, impact and also that I agree with Brad and um, reiterate I think that it is about uh, it's, it's an end of one and that we need to take a long term view and, and the support that is required uh, in, in a system so we look at families, friends, whatever family uh, is defined as and uh, I think that uh, that also that team approach. So as practitioners, we're entering a very interesting and I think exciting stage because of e-mental health as well. And uh, I think the, that as practitioners, if we don't work together, then we'll continue to see people potentially fall through the cracks. Okay, good advice. Thank you very much, Loretta. And finally, Duncan, any quick take-home messages? Yes, uh, understanding military culture is important in treating service members and veterans but it's not absolutely essential. You can learn how to do it. It's not as difficult as you might think. Learning how to do it is uh, best done through asking the patients about their work and taking a full service history as, a, as I outlined before. Okay, thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, thanks to all, just a few very quick closing comments. Uh, the first is to remind you that MHPN run multidisciplinary professional networks where people can get together and share ideas and support each other. and uh, uh, referral uh, networks and so on and they particularly run veteran focused ones so you can see on your screen there a list of places where the veteran uh, focused networks are uh, just uh, click on the join a network document uh, if you would like to um, be part of that and if you would like to start one just get in touch with MHPN uh, as we said there are a whole range of resources associated with this webinar and MHPN will send you a link to those resources I strongly recommend that you go through them and have a look because there's some really useful stuff there. And I always give a particular plug to the At Ease website from DVA. A whole lot of good stuff there for practitioners, for, uh, for veterans and, and serving members and for their families. So uh, don't forget to check that out. Uh, please make sure that you complete the feedback survey uh, before you log out. It's really important for us to know uh, what you thought of tonight and to get your feedback about it. At this point, though, I'd like to thank uh, both DVA and MHPN very much for their uh, work in putting this, this uh, webinar on. I'd like to thank Redback very much for their support for the whole conference. Uh, I'd very much like to thank our panelists who I thought were brilliant tonight. We could have easily gone on for another couple of hours. Uh, so thank you very much indeed to uh, Brad, 
to Loretta and to Duncan. And thank you very much indeed to all of you, our participants, for your engagement and for joining us tonight. And certainly your active engagement makes it a whole lot better for us. So thank you very much and good night to all. Good night.